right. You're listening to Hawk Talk. I'm here today with Reinhard Gensel. How are you? Fine. Fine. Thank Stock you. here already. Oh, is it? Well, to, yes. Well, you know, we are yeah. nine hours apart. Yeah, that's fair. And it's it's that time of year. It's getting dark early. So. Oh, yes. Appreciate you coming on. And to kick it off, I assume, you know, the day you're born, you're, you come into the delivery room and you start discussing different theories of physics. And immediately from day one, that was the what you were on the path to do, correct? Well, uh, no, no, of course not. But <laughs> I do, I do have a heritage. My father yeah. was a physicist, and uh, so I certainly knew about physics. I, I knew even about the so-called Max Planck Society, in which I am now working oh. uh, as as a researcher. But actually, you know, I was initially mostly fascinated by archaeology. Okay. Uh, at that time, I was in a uh, what you would call a Latin school that still existed in in Germany at the time. So I learned uh, ancient Greek and, and Latin and all of this, and yeah. history fascinated me, and so did archaeology. And so, and how old are you? I really thought, oh, maybe 12, 13. And so, I read a lot. Yeah, I, I read a lot about it, and I, I thought, oh wow, that that sounds absolutely fantastic. I'm still, by the way, I'm still fascinated by it. Yeah. Now, why did I not stick with it? Um, well, I then sort of thought, well, let's see. Uh, the Romans, they have researched. The Greeks, the Egypt, all of this is done. Where, where would one do archaeology now? Yeah. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, my God, it's going to be in the tropics. Snakes, yeah. <laughs> mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, actually. Yeah. Was that actually what turned you off? You realized that you were going to end up in a place you didn't want to be if you were going to really try. Yeah, uh, yeah, but but I think I think it was mostly that I I then started understanding a little more. Certainly not at age age two or whatever, but at yeah. age fifteen, I, I I understood more. My father was a very good teacher, and right. so he he helped me. Not the school only the school, but my father was very important. But actually, what I did most at that time. Mostly was sports. Yeah, what sports? Yeah, well, I I was playing handball, and then all then over time I became very very fascinated with uh, track and field, and I, in particular, javelin throwing. And in oh. fact, I when I was sixteen, I was Germany's best uh, javelin thrower. Wow! So I I actually trained uh, for the Olympic Games in Munich. Uh-huh. I never made it, but I trained. I'm, to this day, I'm, I'm really still pretty, still pretty proud. And yeah. in two weeks, in two weeks from now, I'll meet the winner of the javelin competition, uh, 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 Klaus Wolfermann, who who won at that time against a very famous. It would be Russia now, but it was uh, yeah. Lithuania, I think, at the at the time. So wow! And so, and you're just still friends. That's why you're meeting with him. No, I'm not. I'm not. I just, uh, I, I, you know, I've been after the Nobel Prize. I've been in the press, of course, a lot, and yeah. he saw my name, and uh, the press reported my, my, you know, career in 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 sports, and yeah. so uh, that's what he, he 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 contacted me. And so, when did you originally get into the sports side, to, into track and field? When did that all start? Yeah, at, at sort of age fifteen, sixteen. Okay. Uh, and and now of course you see so then in Germany you end up your uh, education in school at age in my case was about 17 18 that kind of thing and so then you have to decide what is it what is it you want to do it was clear I wanted to study and uh, uh, and it was then already clear I would go and study physics got it and 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 you know once that started Honestly, you can't do everything at the same time. Right. Well. Yeah. You you can try, but it's not it's not possible. And so you know, in the end, I I, I decided in favor of uh, of physics. Uh, maybe the right decision, but of course, would have been nice to go to Munich and and, and participate. So, in that. Yeah, that would have been awesome. And so on the physics side, was your original like you? I mean, obviously, you were close with your dad. You said he was a great teacher. Were you like, I'm going to go learn this in school so I can work with my dad and study with, like, was, 
What was the motivation? No, no, no. But but my my father at that point now, you know, now I was in university, you know, going through the usual curricula uh, a physics physics student uh, has to go through. Uh, but then after the sort of first exams, I had to make a decision what you would call in the U.S. which graduate path I would take. Yep. You don't do that in Germany, but in any case, I had to sort of decide where would I want to do my PhD if I would get there. And so there, again, my father became very, very decisive in the sense that he said, okay, well, there's different parts of physics, of course, and you can, uh, you know, think about particle physics or nuclear physics. I wouldn't advise you to do that. There are so many people. Then I said, well, then there is solid state physics. But you see, I'm doing solid state physics, yeah. so you can't go there. <laughs> and so, but is that uh, what about astronomy? And uh, he then said, well, we are just building a new institute uh, in northern Germany near Bonn uh, for radio astronomy. And oh. uh, they are building a big, big telescope, a 100 meter telescope. Why, why don't you think about that? And so I did. And then I changed, so to speak, uh, and, and did my PhD there. Yep. And for st I started in radio astronomy. That's really what it was. But then uh, after, after I, I finished, it was clear I really wanted to go to the U.S. And, uh, and my wife then also, we, we, felt, we felt really wanted to go to the U.S. and maybe even become Americans. Because I say, why was seemed, that? Well, uh, being a post-war German at that time yeah. was not, yeah, not so great. Fair. Think what 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 uh, what we Germans had done, and yep. and since I had a lot of exposure to other people in the world through my father, okay, I I was painfully aware of that, yep. and so that and and you know at that time the U.S. was way ahead of everyone else, uh, and so it seemed like wow that that would be wonderful, and then I started off in 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 Boston in. Harvard and uh, did a postdoc there and that was wonderful, really wonderful. Uh, but then I got the opportunity to to go to California to work with my what turned out to be my, my second father. Yeah. And that's a very, very famous physicist, uh, Charles Towns, yeah. who got his Nobel Prize for the invention of uh, what you now know as laser. He did, he actually built a, a, a a system which has longer wavelengths called Maser, but then you know he basically invented the laser, and he he, he was sort of the, the person I wanted to work with. I mean, the style of research he had, and coming to Berkeley, wow, that was you know fulfillment in a way. Yeah, and in terms of like your pursuit of these different uh, places, what, did you ever have like a sort of end goal or a career in my like I want to you know in my career I want to do X Y Z or some something like that, or are you just taking what was right in front of you and what was exciting and moving through it. Yeah, well, okay. I mean, at that stage of one's career, one, one can be proud, and, and I could be proud that I had been working, uh, luckily at some level, but also maybe because of my focus, on the right kind of uh, scientific uh, research such that something comes out of it, and then you get yeah. more chances. It's, yeah. it's, it's just like, you know, growing and... and, and and hopefully doing something good, then you you gain experience, and then you you grow, and then you know, okay, well maybe maybe what what I'm good at uh, is more like this. I mean, in physics, for instance, you have to know: are you more a theorist or are you more an experimentalist? Okay, right. I'm more an experimentalist. Yeah. Uh, then of course in astronomy, there's a third kind of a person <laughs> that's called the observer. Yeah. Somebody who uses a telescope, but otherwise. Uh, you know, has nothing to do with the equipment, and that I did, right, I didn't find so exciting. So, but with towns, I really learned this sort of style of work we're doing here, and have really brought to a very high level, which is you build very ambitious uh, uh, new instrumentation based on new detectors, electronics, telescopes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then you make measurements which were not uh, previously possible. I mean, yeah, that, that's really the idea. And, and then you go explore, and that's that's the next sort of thing. Uh, uh, many people go when they enter a field and do what other people are doing. 
Yeah. Uh, and I learned with towns that you should look at scientific exploration like going into a forest, a forest which you don't know. Yeah. Uh, you explore it, you learn about it, you you learn about the trees, you learn about the flowers and everything else. And then you you basically begin to understand how this forest thing works. And, well, it sounds like it was an uh, to you. Like you said, with archaeology, you knew, I don't want to go study the Egyptians. They've been studied. Like, you were always looking for, like, I don't want to run down the same path everyone else is. Abs yeah. Absolutely, yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's And, and it, by the way, it seems like that's the more fun side. Like, if you're going to get into science, like, being an explorer, being someone that's really... Uh, yeah, but Eric, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. You can, if you go and explore your forest fall into a deep river which is hiding there totally and then you you know you drown it, it's, the high, it's the high risk high reward side of science but i feel like it's you know again it's where you get like we only get one life here like we might as well even that's we won't get into car or reincarnation but um the uh and so was california everything you thought it would be were you excited to be in the u.s you wanted to stay how did that work out yeah no i think i would say in particular northern california yeah, uh, I had I had the chance several times in my life to go to uh, Caltech in Southern California, yeah. and uh, it's, it's it's a wonderful place, great institutions. Uh, I, I'm not a uh, you know a surfer, yeah. so <laughs> you can teach. I'm, I, I'm doing I'm doing all right uh, in the hiking and 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 so forth through the Sierra Nevada. That was yeah. that was sort of the the, the great points going out in nature, but Northern California was really wonderful. Yeah. And did you end and, up, you were saying you were thinking about becoming U.S. citizens, all that. Did you end up doing that and becoming American? <clears throat> well, that's a very good question. So I, I uh, very, very rapidly after I joined uh, Townsend's group, uh, I got an offer for a professorship at Caltech. Okay. And as soon as Towns heard about this, he uh, basically alerted uh, UC Berkeley's uh, physics department and okay. Uh, within within a month, they made me an offer. Wow. So I actually became professor at age twenty nine in the physics department, and wow. and uh, from then on, I had lots to do. I can tell you, yeah. you know, just uh, this is a new system. You have to teach all the t all the, all of a sudden. You do have to do it in a, in a different language. I mean, here I yeah. could speak English, but uh, you know, uh, speaking English in a <laughs> sort of a Conversational style is one thing, but if if you actually have to do it in front of students, yeah, <laughs> and teach physics in English, like it's like yeah. I don't think I could teach physics in German. I can't speak German. But I also <laughs> definitely don't think I could go that far. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. And so, how long were no, you? No, I mean, it was, I must say, no, I, I California uh, and Berkeley really were just absolutely wonderful for all of us. By that time. Uh, I had initially one child, and then a second uh, daughter came uh, came in Berkeley. My wife is a is a doctor, uh -huh. uh, a medical doctor, and she did her uh, the, the final final touches of her education. She's a neonatologist, and so uh -huh. uh, you know we had a great time. We had a great time, and uh, I would have thought at that time that that that's where I will stay. Yeah. Okay? Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, I got a call from the Max Planck Society, and they said uh, we would like you to become a director in in back in Germany. That was how, hard, I tell I you. Say, how long were hard. you? How long was it, were you into being a professor before that came? Uh, by that time, about uh, four years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I I may I can still remember that I this. I, I made these long lists of the pros and cons. Yeah. You know, I try to be try to be you know scientific about it. What's yeah. good and what is bad. Okay, there's the blue skies. Click that one and 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 so forth. And but I, because again of my father, I knew that there was one absolutely, uh, you know, critical difference between the way research is now done in. Uh, in the U.S., even in the best places, and the uh, possibilities in the Max Planck Society, and that is, in in the U.S. system and actually in German universities, you have to always, you know, hunt for grants yeah. for money, uh, in order to continue. 
in the Max Planck Society, there is a very strict way to hire. But once you're hired, uh, although, you know, you're still there checking on you, but it's, it's uh, the, the support, it's the, the scientific the support, the resources, and even this, the staff level is so good that you can take risk. Yep. And then again, you don't have to run in the, in the, in the direction or the entire crowd is running. Right. You go in your own, your own forest. Yeah, and explore that one. Okay, yeah. no, so that that is, I, I realized that that you know while it would have, would have been fantastic to stay in Berkeley, I knew this would also limit, so to speak, my possibilities of uh, finding my own forest. And yeah. so in the end, I made that jump back to Germany. And there was a se- actually I should say it was a second phase, uh, fifteen years later when Germany was not doing so well after the reunification, actually. Uh-huh. Uh, then I reconsidered going back uh, uh, to Berkeley. And in fact, since 98, I've been part-time professor in Berkeley. So I'm, I'm sort of a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm living in both places. How is it with that your kids? You asked me about a citizenship. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. The problem is... Um, in Germany, you cannot have, or at least at that time, yeah. you could not have two citizenships. Got it. And I did not want to give up the German one and and only bank on the U.S. one. My ideal always was have both. Yeah. In case there is a war, yeah, you can go the other way. Huh? Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, it, for so I could I couldn't get rid of the German one, but I had a green card and. That was, for most purposes, good enough until uh, you had this president who might become president again, and he decided uh, uh, that he didn't want to have long-term green card, yeah. card holders anymore, and they took my green card away, actually, wow. in, in 2017. And that was very sad, I must say, very sad. Well, and if there's one testament to how messed up our immigration system is, we have a Nobel Prize winning physicist that wants to have a green card in the U.S. and we're saying no. Like uh, that that should be every country would, would want like that's like the epitome of what you want to come and work and be a, in your country. So it, it's yeah, don't disagree. We had the same problem with actually some employees here when he you know took out all those green cards and, and visas. We had employees on visas here that we had to we had to fire because we couldn't legally oh, employ them anymore. Yeah. And it was like that's very it's very narrow minded now. Yeah. Look, uh, to be honest, uh, this th- discussion about you know who can and who cannot uh, as foreigners be yeah. in one's country is not germane to the U.S. Of course, I no. mean as you well know, yeah. it is now happening all through uh, Europe. It's changing the the political scene here in Germany, even again in, in very bad ways. Yeah, in very bad ways. That the right wing uh, is is coming up because they say close the borders, close the borders, don't let anyone in. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon, unfortunately. Yeah, it's this weird shift to nationalism. I agree. Um, and so, how? By the way, your kids were how old when you moved back to Germany? Uh, the older one was seven. Okay. Uh, so she was already in school in Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, for two years, and the younger one was sort of. Uh, uh, Four and a half. Yeah, so, so young enough she, that it wasn't a crazy shift. Yeah, but but we we you know we kept the English. So uh-huh. in in the family we are speaking English. Got it. And in fact, uh, the older daughter is now back in California and is yeah. working in uh, San Francisco in oh, nice. a startup company. Yes, and and my uh, younger daughter is a professor in Mainburg in Holland. Okay. So we uh, we are we've become. An, a global, yeah. a global family. That's awesome. And so, when you after going back to Germany, did, how what like was it? What you hoped it was once you got in there, you were just fully supported. You, you you said that Germany did go through a rough time in the reunification. Like, how was that experience? Were you happy with that decision after you did this scientific study? Oh, no, most most more well, yeah, most of the time I was, and and I have to say, you know, uh, it's a bit of a paradise, and the, the the maybe I could even say. Uh, I came at a time when that advantage I mentioned to you, that I basically didn't have to hunt for money all the time, uh, but could just go ahead and take risks and so forth, was particularly valuable for the kind of 
uh, research I was wanted to do, and and so that has allowed us to explore these forests where really nobody else could go in and 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 then uh, tell them about it. Okay. Yeah, uh, and so. How did that end up producing? Like, I mean, obviously, I don't want to skip too far ahead, but you end up with a Nobel Prize. Like, when you started going down these forests, as you said, there's deep pits you can fall into, too, and deep holes. So how was it when you went down these paths? Again, I know you had the support, but did you ever run into dead ends? Obviously, you run into small dead ends, but were there any points where you're like, this whole thing was a waste? No, I was lucky. I was lucky because... Uh, uh, so be, I'm, I'm very interested in understanding... Uh, how systems like our Milky Way, yeah. uh, other Milky Ways, billions of Milky Ways in the universe, yeah. how they how they came about, how they grew over t- cosmic time, and uh, that immediately is connected. It turns out to, uh, with the question of black holes, and so uh, th- this question uh, was really ripe for the taking, and especially with very good new equipment. Uh, of very high resolution techniques in the so-called infrared, not optical, but infrared. And uh, so uh, once once we started on that, it was a very rich, uh, you know, field to harvest because nothing, not, not yeah. that much had, had been done before. Uh, I also did work in space with uh, the European Space Agency. So that was also lucky, could have failed. Did you ever get to uh, go to space? Yes, oh, yeah. uh, personally. Yeah. No, 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 oh. no, 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 not manned space. This is yeah, basically kind of, building, yeah. building an, an, an instrument for a big space observatory and then, uh, yeah. uh, 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 you know, use the data which come down from the, from the. Have you had a desire space. to actually on a man, go on a man trip to space? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. It wouldn't interest me. No, I don't think so. Because you see, uh, the, 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 the speed at which you can uh, explore that for us yeah. as a human being is like you know s- slower than an ant yeah. trying to explore the world yeah and and you know i always you know right now many many people are very excited about the question of extra extrasolar planets yeah which have been discovered 25 years ago and now there is just an absolutely fantastic uh, you know expansion of that field we are beginning to understand the, the chemistry of the atmospheres of these uh, extrasolar planets. But of course, in the minds of most humans who think about this, there's the question, oh, are there little green men yeah, somewhere? Yeah, 100%. Right? Yeah. Right? You saw and I always... And, and then now, of course, you see, the next next extrasolar planet is sort of, uh, yeah, about 10 light years away. Uh-huh. Uh, 10 right. light years away. So that means light takes 10 years. Okay. okay. Now, if we would take a rocket and we had a powerful enough rocket with the current technology, it'll you know, take 10,000 years <laughs> to, to get there. So it's hopeless. But but even the question of the little green man, because uh, most of these extrasolar planets uh, nowadays are a little further away than this t- 10 light years. So the as I always say, the, the telephone conversation is pretty damn boring. Yeah. It sort of says, "Oh, hey, this is Reinhardt. Hello." Yeah. <laughs> and then you wait twenty years yeah. until you know your whatever comes back. Yeah, that's actually interesting. I wonder at what point we'll have deep space telescopes. That yes, it'll take us five years to get the imagery back, but we'll have imagery from five light years away at some point. Yeah, of course. And indeed, I mean, having seen these enigmatic pictures of Earth. Is by the voyagers yeah. is is obviously one of these moments, but of course, let's be honest. Uh, the where the voyagers are now, uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't really learn anything new from the fact yeah. that they're there. Yeah, uh, and that's the that's the power, of course, of the remote sensing capabilities which we have yeah. from the ground or from from nearby space. Yeah. Okay, so you don't have to go there. So I, I'm, I'm in that sense more skeptical about manned spaceflight because, I mean, it's, it's uh, extremely expensive. And, of course, it adds, we have learned, NASA has learned this, not only can there be accidents and people get killed, but also, of course, uh, 
uh, it really limits the the possibilities of what you can actually put up there in space because yeah. you can't go very far. Right. What was I, I mean? I want to. I'll get to the what you got the Nobel Prize for, but you focused on black holes and these masses in space. Actually, to take a step back before that. How, you said your dad was your first mentor. How long was he involved in all this? How long were you, I mean, obviously as a kid, but were you, how long was he around through all this? Was he there when you first came back to Munich? Like, how was that relationship? Yeah, yeah, he was, in fact, uh, you see, he, in uh, in 1970, so when, when I was just beginning to go to university, he then changed from university to Max Planck. So okay. he was also a Max Planck director, just like I am. Yeah. And again, that was extremely helpful because he could give me insights and advice, which really you know, are highly advantageous when you have to make the decision, do I go from Berkeley, where it's yeah. wonderful and blue skies, to, to rainy Germany? Huh? Uh, and, and so he did, he did that. He, he, he passed away in the early 2000s and... Uh, so he, he, he so you worked a lot. I was I was already back in Germany when when he passed away. So we had uh, the last years we had often we were visiting and, and 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 talking about this that and the other thing. And what was his focus on the science side? Like you said, obviously physics, but what what was he really? Focused so he on? was a uh, you know he was interested in how how solids work uh, in uh, in particular. Uh, uh, semiconductors and, wow. and, and, and conductors and so forth, how the innermost workings of these crystal structures uh, came about and uh, uh, the energy uh, conversion in there and so forth. So he uh, is a solid, he was a solid state physicist, as we, as we say, an experimentalist. So he did a, a, a lot of experiments. Actually, some of the techniques which he developed as a younger professor, uh, we later on applied in astronomy uh, uh, because we wanted to build a, a, what we call a spectrometer, so to disperse the light and actually resolve the you know, spectral properties of infrared light. And some of the things my father had done was very useful in that regard. Nice. Um, and so... Going moving forward, uh, what were you were focusing on again? These different masses in space, and you know, exploring that. When did you really feel you had your first major discovery? Like, what was the first big pivotal moment that you, you know, again made a breakthrough in that sense? Mm -hmm. Well, already actually, uh, I would say at the end of my student years and the first years in the U.S., mm -hmm. because we were then, as I told you, we were doing radio astronomy, yeah. uh, but not just with one single telescope. We, uh, we used a technique which is called intercontinental uh, radio interferometry. So mm -hmm. you take telescopes which are on different continents even. Uh, you can do this nowadays across the entire globe. Yeah. And then you record the electronic signals from whatever source you're interested in, in the radio. And you don't record just the intensity, you record actually the electric field. And so once you then bring the signals back together after the recording in a, in a common site, you can reconstruct uh, the inter what we call the interference of the light between uh, the, 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 the two different telescopes or many telescopes and then invert this, analyze this, and get an image uh, with the resolution of the entire size separation of the uh, antennas. Yep. So instead of a 100 meter antenna, which is already pretty big, you have now an antenna, which is the equivalent of thousands of kilometers uh, in size. You can imagine what detail you can see. And so we, we at that time, we solved one particular pr problem in the formation of stars, and, and that was sort of the first breakthrough of that type. Now with towns, I got immediately into the issue of black holes, and i tell you why. I mean, um, the issue of black holes emerged as soon as Einstein's uh, theory of relativity mm -hmm. came out. That was in 1915-16, and uh, when you look at in, if, you, if you look at these equations, which people did at the time, and, and, and try to solve them in simple cases, say for a spherically symmetric 
system, uh, then you find uh, that photons, light, experience gravity. Right. In Newton's theory, that was not the case. And so that means if photons see gravity, you can think of a star uh, and then you send a rocket from the surface of the, of the star and it gets into infinity when it goes faster than a certain amount, uh, which in the case of the Earth for a rocket yeah. this is about 11 kilometers per second. Uh, now, if you make such a star ever more compact or more massive, then gravity increases. And that means that the speed of your rocket has to increase. Yeah. And so in, 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 in the thought experiment, you could take the sun where that speed is uh, 600 kilometers per second and now compress in your mind the sun to an object which has the same mass but only three kilometers in size. And then you calculate the rocket speed and what comes out is the speed of light. Got it. Okay? Yep. Once you have that, you know that such a sun, if it's a millimeter smaller than that three kilometers, cannot anymore send out light yeah. because light cannot run out against gravity. Yeah. And so you have a characteristic uh, radius in such an object we call the event horizon inside which anything, whether photons or rockets or whatever you want to send out from there, will not make it out. That's a black hole. Yeah. Okay? Yep. And so uh, now there's a, another side of this, of these black holes, which is if you, if you, if you sit on the rocket and, and you can't make it out, what, what about traveling inside the black hole, take a few pictures and, and so yeah. forth? <laughs> um, well, it turns out you, once you're inside of this event horizon, not only can you not send any messages out or yeah. yourself, you also cannot stop. Uh, you will fall into the center. And center means uh, a point. And in that point, everything which makes up the mass or the energy of the black hole is, is combined in a, what we call a singularity, infinite density. It's a really strange concept. Yeah. Uh, and so this theory was there First solutions were found a year later by Schwarzschild. And then 50 years, it was a matter of, of, of theorists refining this particular theory, you know, understanding it, and it's a complicated theory. But what about the universe? Yeah. Do these black holes exist? And, and did nature actually sort of, you know, say, oh, uh, I make black holes somehow? Yeah. And that was not known. And it was until the 1960s when the first candidates became, uh, you know, possible to see uh, where people started speculating. Yep. These might be black holes. Was it just places and so, where there was literally darkness and it didn't make sense? Like stars? No, no, that's, that's, that's <laughs> the other way around. In fact, I, ah. uh, this is, you, will be, you will be surprised the way this goes. Uh, what happened was uh, the radio astronomers told you about radio astronomy, uh, were then beginning to have good enough telescopes that they could make pictures of the sky, just like optical pictures. Yep. And when they did, uh, they found lots of objects, some of them the same objects which were already known, uh, just in the, in the radio, uh, but then they also found very bright radio sources, which did not have much of an optical counterpart. And then if the, the optical astronomers uh, used the biggest telescopes, like on Palomar, okay? Yeah. Uh, then they, they found little faint, little uh, star-like objects. These things we call quasars. Now, it turns out they're so faint. Uh, it's not because they're weak. No, on the contrary, they're extremely powerful radiators, but they're very far away. Yeah. Extremely far away. The first one which was found, in fact, turned out to be about three billion light years away. So the light wow. takes three billion years. That's a significant fraction of the age of the universe. Yeah. And uh, so how could you be so bright? Because if it, if you then calculate how much energy actually is produced there, this compact little thing, it turned out to be a thousand times uh, the light of the entire Milky Way. All of this wow. in, a, in a little speck yeah. of less than a light year across. How could that be? How could you, how could you, you know? And so the theorists uh, thought about this for about a decade and came up with a paradoxical solution. 
black holes. Now you would say, come on, you're joking. You just told me that light cannot escape. Well, I told you light cannot escape within this, what I call the event horizon. Yeah. But when you go outside of the event horizon, light can escape. It, it. it loses energy, but it can escape. Now you turn this around, you, you have such an object in space somewhere. Then of course, it's gravity is seen by other things around it. Yeah. And that attracts material to yeah. fall in. Got it. And that can be gas, it can be stars, anything you can think of. Yeah. And so that 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 gas let's think of a gas cloud. That gas cloud as it falls inward gains in energy because of the gravitation. Yeah. And that energy gain you can convert into radiation. And it turns out that by the time it disappears behind the event horizon uh, the amount of energy you get out of each proton which falls in there uh, is about equivalent to 10, 20 percent the uh, total maximum amount of energy, mc squared. Remember the yep. famous formula yep. of Einstein's mc squared, where m is the mass uh, and c is the right? speed of light. Yep. So, so that is enormously more efficient than the fusion of hydrogen into helium, which is how stars make the energy. So this is how the idea came about. Uh, but then, of course, this is a hypothesis. And in, in science, uh, theories or hypotheses are no good until you can actually either uh, test them through or, and, 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 and show that they're correct or that they're wrong. And, and so that, that started in the 70s. And so when I went and, and joined Towns' uh, group, uh, we were beginning to uh, ask the question, well, maybe these black holes, uh, they have become very bright because that's, it's very rare to have so much accretion. Uh, but maybe there are other black holes in other galaxies, maybe in our own galaxy, yeah. but it's just not accreting much and therefore it's not very bright. That's the correct explanation we now know. We now know that basically every Milky Way uh, in the universe has a black hole. There's just very few accrete so much that they become so bright. And that was. And so then, once you once you say maybe the black galactic center it has a it has a black hole in it, that's not three billion light years away. It's only twenty nine thousand light years away. That's still far away, but yeah. uh, uh, nearby enough that you can think of making measurements of motions of things, uh, stars or gas, so that you can test the hypothesis that there is a... And that's what we did. But initially, we had the first successes very early on already in the 80s, yeah. but nobody would believe us. They would say, ah, yeah, well, okay, you now know that there is a, some mass around there, but yeah. how do you know it's a black hole? It could be a cluster of stars, uh, whatever. And so that, that tour... That trip it took from you know so sort of getting the first ideas oh maybe, maybe there is a, a a few million solar mass black hole in the galactic so to actually proving it uh, in an incontrovertible way uh, that took forty years yeah and that's the part that I think that a lot of people aren't familiar with is like these theories take decades and decades and decades and decades to mm. develop so the stuff that we know now you were talking about 40 years ago because like we you know i've seen headlines about having a black hole at the center of the milky way and like i mean i've seen that in I, I, it was probably in the wall street journal or new york times or something like it's been broadly broadcasted now this is something you started working on in the 80s and got the nobel prize yes. for in 2020 right yes yeah and so and i'm curious on that how did that feel like was that did you was it like when you got the Nobel Prize, did you feel pride, recognition, success, or did you, was it just like the res, like that was more of a function of something you were more excited about, which is the actual theory that you? No, no, look, I actually, I, I should say the following. I, I did get a, as you say correctly, we already were, you know, to, to many in, in the astronomy community, but then also increasingly to the outside. Our work and that of my colleague Andrea Guess at uh, UCLA uh, became very well known, and people sort of uh, uh, were very much excited about the fact that these two different groups uh, worked in competition but got the same result. And that's that's exactly 
that how we will have to work, right? I mean, yep. if, if 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 I get a result and you do a, another experiment and we get you get a different result, well, then uh, the other colleagues would say, well, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. But but if two competing groups get the same result, that yeah. And so already, so by I would say 2002, uh, most of the astronomers would believe us, but uh, we were still at that time too far away from the, the, the black hole to really be sure. Yeah. And it took another 20 years to get there. And that, that is really sort of the, the, the way, you know, things work. Ah, but on that path, people started recognizing me and, and gave me good prizes, I have to say, very good prizes. Uh -huh. And in fact, in 2012, Andrea and I got a prize from the Swedish Academy uh -huh. called the Crawford Prize. Now, the Crawford Prize, in a way, is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for fields for which there is no Nobel. And honestly, astronomy actually initially, uh, according to the wishes of Mr. Nobel, is not a field where you should, can get a Nobel Prize. Huh. It's physics, okay? And yes, there were a very few uh, Nobel Prizes in physics uh, made uh, or given on astrophysical Uh, research, very few. For instance, the exp ex expansion of the universe, uh, okay, Hubble, yep. did not get a did wow. not get a Nobel Prize. Did not get a Nobel Prize. So, so in a way, uh, in 2012, after having gotten the the Crawford Prize, I I was fairly sure that's it. Okay. Yep. Now, it, it, tr truth to be said, I mean, we did after 2012 actually then make the big next step. Uh, using this technique of interferometry now in the infrared, which uh, increased our resolution still further and let us go still further to the to the near near to the black hole. But I didn't expect it. So when the famous telephone call came in in uh, October uh, 2020, I was in a Zoom conference. Remember October 2020? Everyone was. Uh, you know, pandemic. <laughs> so I, I sat where I'm sitting now in a, in, a, in, a, in a Zoom conference with colleagues and there comes this telephone call. It was a very gray day, you know, I take the telephone and I say, oh, um, I want to tell you that you've got the Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, I sort of thought, mm, they must be joking. Uh, can't be right. Uh, it's probably a hallucination having to do with the bad weather and, and the pandemic or something. So there's no way, so it took me, it's literally just a phone call. You've won the Nobel Prize in physics. Wow, that's amazing. That's how it goes. Yep. And, and uh, you know, so did Andrea at that time. And the third one in, was a theorist, uh, Roger Penrose. Mm -hmm. uh, now, for the Europeans, it's better because you get called during the day. Andrea got her call, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in the <laughs> at night. Yeah. When she was sleeping, you know, that's even worse, right? Because yeah. then you, th you really think you have hallucinations. Yeah, wake up to a voicemail too. Um, <laughs> so a couple more questions for you. Number one, given the Nobel Prize, like what's next? Do you leverage that to get into deeper research? Like is there some, what do you think is coming down the pike for you? As I told you, the, the overwhelming, you know, total, I mean, uh, uh, t top question here is, uh, is not only the question of whether these black holes exist, which is what we now proven. We have not yet proven that they are fully exactly, exactly mathematically uh, that uh, as predicted by, uh, by Einstein. That is still to be done, but that they exist in approximately that form, that's, that's pretty clear. Uh, the next question which we are after now And the famous James Webb telescope is, is actually hunting that down right now, is when did these black holes and the galaxies form? Mm -hmm. And how? And how did they grow? And, and, and all of this. Then so that's sort of a bigger question, and really, how is the structure, which we can see with our telescopes? Uh, in fact, when we, when we see the very faint objects, we see far away objects, that means at the same time, We're doing a trip back in time. Right. So we are seeing objects which are far away. And so the James Webb can now see objects which are which formed already a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Oh. That's fantastic. Yeah. And so that's sort of the next big step. 
The next big step is to follow this evolution uh, back in time. But of course, at the same time, we still have to, uh, you know, not not stop in, in our proof of that they're really, these black holes are really the objects which Einstein uh, predicted. I mean, you cannot believe there are many, many productive, highly brainy physicists around who say, oh, yeah, 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 you have proven it's probably sort of a black hole, but is it the black hole exactly like yeah. uh, Einstein's theory? So uh, you can get uh, pretty painstakingly <laughs> detailed in, in this field sometimes. Oh, that's great. And so last question for you. As someone that stuck with the same theory for 40 years to prove it out, to make sure to like really stick with it, what would be your advice to someone that's either just starting out, trying to figure out what they want to do to like really get through and stick with it and you know come out successful the other side? Got to be fun. That's it. I mean, you know, now you, please don't. I hope you got the impression and, and, and your viewers also that it's not that I, I would do the same kind of stuff for 40 years. Yeah. yeah no. uh, you know, we would, in fact, have a lot of the fun exploring things and finding things along the way in, in exploring the forest. And so before you then in the end find the gold nugget, you find, uh, you know, mushrooms and, and, and flowers and, and the likes. And yeah. they are very interesting to understand and, and so forth. So the, the explorer can have really on the way to the ultimate <clears throat> target and the ultimate question can have a, a lot of fun. And I did. I'm 71 years old now and I surely do not want to retire. Yeah. And that, awesome. it's just fun. Yeah. Well, that's great. And Reinhard, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on Hawk Talk. Okay. Good, Eric. Yeah.